everything. Let's open with a word of prayer. Abba, we thank you again for the honor of coming before you as your adoring children on this, your holy Shabbat, to study your Torah, to learn your heart, what moves you. Oh, Father, we want to know you. We want to be like you. Thank you for continuing to prune us, for opening our eyes, teaching us your ways as we study your word. And we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. Hashem Yeshua, Mishiach, and in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. All right, Bayetze is our Torah portion this week, and it means he went out. It's the portion when Jacob goes out to Laban's to seek a wife. And we're going to start reading at the beginning. Genesis 28.10. It says, Yaakov left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he had reached a certain place, he stopped there for the night, since the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he made it his pillow and lay down where he was. He had a dream. There was a ladder, planted on the ground with its top reaching to heaven, and God's angels were going up and down on it. And there was Yahweh standing beside him and saying, I, Yahweh, and the God of Abraham your father, the God of Yitzhak, the ground on which you are lying, I shall give to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as plentiful as the dust of the ground. You will spread out to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and all clans on earth will bless themselves by you and your descendants. Be sure, I am with you. I shall keep you safe wherever you go and bring you back to this country, for I shall never desert you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Yaakov awoke from his sleep and said, Truly, Yahweh is in this place, and I did not know. He was afraid and said, How awe-inspiring this place is! This is nothing less than the abode of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Early next morning, Yaakov took the stone that he had used for his pillow and set it up as a pillar, pouring oil over the top of it. He named the place Bethel, which is the house of God. But before the town had been called Luz, Yaakov then made this vow. If God remains with me and keeps me safe on this journey I am making, if he gives me food to eat and clothes to wear, and if I come home safe to my father's home, then Yahweh shall be my God. This stone I have set up as a pillar is to be a house of God, and I shall faithfully pay you a tenth part of everything you give me. Yahweh made a promise to Yaakov, which he had no problem believing as he had just seen Yahweh's angels ascending and descending from heaven. He'd had this vision. What purpose do these angels serve? Well, David gives us some insight in Psalms 103.20. It says, Bless Yahweh, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless Yahweh, all you his hosts, you ministers of his, who do his pleasure. This psalm starts out and says, Bless Yahweh, O my soul, and all that is within me. So the angels are to bless Yahweh just like we are. But they hasten to perform His word. They heed the voice of His word. They do His word. So guess what? If we speak His word, it activates the angels. Because they it doesn't say they follow just Yahweh. They follow His word. And it doesn't matter who speaks it. If we're speaking it, his words are just as alive as when we speak them as they are when he speaks them. And it activates the angels. They're ministers who do Yahweh's pleasure. Psalms 104, the next psalm says, Who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. Now the book of Enoch erroneously teaches that the demons are the spirits of the Nephilim. Nowhere in scripture does it say that. The book of Enoch is the cult writing at Qumran, the, the sect at Qumran. Most people think it was the Essenes. Wrote, it's kind of like the Book of Mormon. Yeah, there's some truth in it, but it is not scripture. It was a contemporary write, uh, writing that Jude quoted from, but it's just like making reference to, like, the force be with you. You, you would know what that's from. That's not from the Bible, but, but it is something that our society understands. And, and even though... Star Wars is not inspired. It's something that people can relate to. So a lot of ministers in their messages do this kind of stuff. Jude made that part of it inspired because he quoted it as scripture. But they knew about it back in that day. It never made it into the Bibles. It was called the pseudopigrapha, part of the pseudopigrapha, because it was actually a forgery. Enoch did not write it. 
So it was written by a bunch of different people, but this here in Psalms 104, which David wrote, we know that his angels are spirits. So you don't have to have different spirits. The angels are spirits. They're the, the fallen angels or the demons. Satan entered Judas. We know that angels, fallen angels, can enter people because we saw it happen with the top guy. So there doesn't have to be other spirits. So this shows us that the angels are spirits. Ministers, his ministers, a flame of fire. So angels are spirit beings that can appear as fire. Exodus 3, 1, we see it actually happening. Now Moshe kept the flock of Yitro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moshe said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not near or hither. Put off your shoes from off your feet, for the place whereon you are standing is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, and the God of Yaakov. And Moshe hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now here, this special angel, this is not a regular angel. He represents Yahweh, and he appeared as fire. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir over all things, through whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so better than the angels, as he had by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. So obviously Yeshua is not an angel. The Jehovah Witnesses missed it. He is not Michael the Archangel. He's better than all the angels. Matter of fact, he's the one that made the angels because all things were made by him and without him nothing was made that was made. So he's actually the one that made the angels. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. So he receives glory from the angels. Just like Yahweh. Because he's part of Elohim. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Where do you say that? Psalms 104. We just read it. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits, since forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? So the angels minister to Yeshua and to us, the ones who inherit salvation. They are here for us. Now we don't command them, we don't worship them, we don't seek after them, but we need to know about them. We need to know that Yahweh uses them. And they're part of his plan. So here we're told that the angels are sent to minister to us. And the angel that appeared to Moses in the burning bush is a very special angel. It's called an angel. The angel in Hebrew is Malach. And what it actually means is messenger. Angel in the Greek is angelos. It's where the word angel came from. They just transliterated it, the sounds, the phonetic sounds, angelos, but it means messenger. So when you're saying angel, it's literally what it means is messenger. So the messenger of Yahweh is not a, quote, angel like the other angels. He's a very special one. We're going to see it's actually Yeshua. He doesn't ever give us his name in the Tanakh, though, because he wasn't born of a virgin yet. He didn't actually get that name assigned to him until he was born. In Exodus 33, 1, or 18, it says, 
And he said, Please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. So no man can see the face of Yahweh and live. Or the face of Elohim. The Father has actually never been to this earth. We're going to look at a couple verses that tells us that. So it's always been Yeshua that we've interacted with. And even when he appears, he has to limit his glory. We can't see his face if he's appearing that way. Otherwise, it'll destroy us. The glory of Yahweh is just too, too intense. And he has to appear in a veiled form. He interacts with us as a man. And sometimes it's, he's called an angel. But we'll, we'll look a few more verses and look at that. Genesis 32, 22. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Yaakov was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? He said, Yaakov. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Yaakov, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Yaakov asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. See, he would never give his name in the Tanakh. And Yaakov called the name of the place Peniel. Pani or Panim, it's literally face, and El, God. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So Yaakov wrestled with God in a veiled form, yet he knew that it was God. God appeared to Jacob in the form of a man. Now look what Hosea, how he describes this. Hosea 12, 2. Yahweh also brings a charge against Judah and will punish Yaakov according to his ways. According to his deeds, he will recompense him. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and in his strength he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spoke to us. That is Yahweh, God of hosts. Yahweh is his memorable name. So the prophet Hosea reveals that God appeared in the form of an angel who looked like a man to Yaakov. Back to Genesis 22, 15. And the angel of Yahweh called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, says Yahweh, for because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So the angel of Yahweh called unto Abraham and spoke as Yahweh. He's basically the body of Yahweh. He speaks and represents Yahweh. Exodus 3, 2. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moshe said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe, he said, here am I. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, and the God of Yaakov. And Moses, Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. But yet he could because it was an angel representing God, representing Elohim, the body, in a limited form, in a veiled form. And again, it was Yahweh that speaks through the angel of Yahweh. Now we see a little more about this angel in Acts 7.37. This is the actual angel that gave us the Torah. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, Yahweh your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. 
So it was the angel of Yahweh who gave us the living oracles. It was Yeshua that got it from the Father and gave it to Moses. So the commandments of Christ that all the Christians want to follow, they started at Mount Sinai. This is something you can show them in Acts, that it demonstrates that it was Yeshua, basically the angel of Yahweh, that gave us the Torah. So these are his commandments. Judges 6.22, we see another incident with Gideon. Gedon perceived that he was the angel of Yahweh. So Gedon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of Yahweh face to face. Then Yahweh said to him, Peace be with you. Shalom Aleichem. Do not fear, you shall not die. So Gedon built an altar there to Yahweh and called it Yahweh is peace, Yahweh Shalom. To this day it is still in Ophrah of the Abazirites. So Gedon knew that the angel of Yahweh was God. And he was afraid because he'd seen his face. He knows that no one can see the face of God and live. But yet, when the angel appears, it's in a veiled form. Judges 13.9 And God listened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came to the woman again as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. This is Samson's parents. Then the woman ran in haste and told her husband and said to him, Look, the man who came to me the other day has just now appeared to me. So Manoah rose and followed his wife. Then he came to the man. He said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. Skipping to verse 18. And the angel of Yahweh said to him, Why do you ask my name? Seeing it's wonderful. Again, he won't give his name. So Manoah took the young goat, with the grain offering, and offered it upon a rock to Yahweh. And he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went up towards heaven from the altar the angel of Yahweh ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw it, they fell on their faces to the ground. When the angel of Yahweh appeared no more to Manoah and his wife, then Manoah knew that he was the angel of Yahweh. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. They knew it was God, even though it was an angel. But yet he was in a veiled form, one that they could interact with. So Yahweh again appears in the form of a man as the angel of Yahweh. Genesis 18.1, Then Yahweh appeared to him by the tabernacle trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door of the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. Then Yahweh said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin is so great, that I shall go down and see whether or not their actions are as the outcry reaching me would suggest. Then I shall know. While the men left there and went to Sodom, Yahweh remained in Abraham's presence. So it looked like three men. One of them was Yahweh, though, and then the other two we know were angels because they went there and they got Lot and his wife out, if you keep reading. So again, Yahweh appeared to Abraham in the form of a man, and the two angels did as well. They looked like men. So this is clearly Yahweh and the two angels who went on to Sodom to get Lot, not a form of the Trinity as some teach, because in John 1.18 it says, No man has seen God at any time, past, present, or even future. We can't see him in these, these regular bodies. It will destroy us. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And then in 1 John 4.12, No man has seen God at any time. We've got two witnesses. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. So no man has ever seen God, only Yeshua. This realm cannot contain the Father's glory. And I fully believe that in 2 Peter chapter 3, that's what melts the elements with fervent heat. When the fire rains down from heaven in, in Revelation chapter 20 and destroys those that have come at Jerusalem, it just keeps melting and burning. It's the presence of Yahweh, the Father, that just comes down and does the great white throne, and his glory just melts everything. And then he reforms it in a substance, gives us glorified bodies, everybody that don't have theirs. And then everything's made in a substance that can contain his glory. Glorified bodies, glorified heaven and earth. So this special messenger, our angel, has always represented Elohim in a veiled way. It's basically, Yeshua is part of the triune nature of Yahweh. He made us in his image and his likeness. We are a body, soul, and a spirit, but we're one individual. But yet we've got three distinct parts. Yeshua is part of Elohim, but he's like the body of Elohim, the physical body that we can interact with, in a, and he veils that glory so that we can interact with him without it destroying us. And when we become part of the body of Yeshua, 
as we're going to continue to study and see, we become part of Elohim as well. We are grafted in together with Elohim, fused together as one, Echad. So the special angel has always represented Elohim in a veiled way. And what's interesting is when we are made part of him, we do the same thing now. That same presence is in us. And it's not less than it was in Yeshua. The same spirit that raised Messiah from the dead dwells in us and gives life to our mortal bodies. Exodus 24, 9 says, Then Moshe went up also, Aharon, Nadav, Abihu, and the seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. Obviously not the Father, though. This was again Yeshua. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate, and they drank. So a God again appeared to Moses and the elders of Israel in a veiled form. We know that Yeshua is God in the flesh. He came as a man. It's getting kind of hard to focus here, Solomon. John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, could not overcome it, it says in other translations. There was a man sent from God whose name was Yochanan, John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, born again. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Yeshua is the light of the world. He is God in the flesh. And he's the one that gives the Holy Spirit. Look at John chapter 20, verse 21. Then said Yeshua to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive you the Holy Spirit. Whoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whoever sins you retain, they are retained. And again, it was Yeshua that spoke to Shaul on the road to Damascus. He knocked him off his horse. But this time he told him his name. He would never give it in a Tanakh because he had never been born of a virgin at that point, and he wouldn't reveal it until he was. So in Acts 9.4 it says, And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Yeshua, whom you persecute. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will you have me do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told you what you must do. Since Yeshua was born, he no longer keeps his name secret. Yeshua is the Lord who instructed Ananias. Acts chapter 9, verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. To him the Lord in a vision said, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise, and go to the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prays. And has seen a vision, in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on your name. But the Lord said unto him, Go your way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Yeshua, that appeared unto you as in the way as you came, has sent me. Again, the Lord Yeshua has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And again, it was Yeshua who taught the gospel to Shaul. Galatians 1.11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught, taught it, but by the revelation of Yeshua Messiah, who was the angel or the messenger of Yahweh. So it's Yeshua who appears to John and gives him the revelation or the vision of revelation. Yeshua is the unique messenger who is God, unlike any other angel. It is not Michael. Now where else do we see the angels, the normal angels? Again, Genesis 32, 1, early next morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and daughters and blessed them. Then Laban went to return home. While Yaakov was going on his way, angels of God encountered him. And on seeing them, he said, this is God's camp. And he named the place Mahani'aim. So Yaakov sees the angels twice in our portion. God's wanting us to understand. They're here, and they're here to help. They're filling this room right now. Or at least there's a few of them here. I don't know how many. I can't see them, but we know they're here. So Yahweh clearly wants Yaakov, as well as us, to know that angels are all around us. And they are actively working on our behalf. Now, we'll get more insight in Daniel chapter 10. I heard a voice speaking. And the sound of the voice, I fell fainting, face downwards on the floor, or on the ground. I felt a hand touching me, setting my knees and my hands trembling. He said, Daniel, you are a man specially chosen. Understand the words that I am about to say. Stand up. I have been sent to you now. And he said this, and I stood up trembling. Then he said, Daniel, do not be afraid. From the day, the first day when you... The better to understand you resolve to mortify yourself before God. Your words have been heard. And your words are the reason why I have come. The prince of the kingdom of Persia has been resisting me now for 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to my assistance. I have left him confronting the kings of Persia. Kings of Persia. Now we don't know if there's multiple demons involved or if it's the actual physical king and the spiritual counterpart, the demon behind him. But it's interesting that it's plural here, and have come to tell you what will happen to your people in the final days. For here's a new vision about those days. When he had said these things to me, I prostrated myself to the ground without saying a word. Then someone looked like a man, touched my lips, and I opened my mouth to speak, and I said to the person standing in front of me, My Lord, anguish overcomes me at this vision, and my strength deserts me. How can your servant speak to my Lord now that I have no strength left, and my breath fails me? Once again, the person, like a man, touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, he said. You are a man specially chosen. Peace be with you. And play the man. In other words, suck it up. Be a man. <laughs> be strong. And as he spoke to me, I felt strong again and said, Let my Lord speak. You have given me strength. He then said, Do you know why I have come to you? It is to tell you what is written in the book of truth. I must go back to fight with the prince of Persia. When I have overcome him, the prince of Javan, says the prince of Greece in most translations, will come next. In all this, there is no one to lend me support except Michael, your prince, on whom I rely to give me support and to reinforce me. So these angels were dispatched immediately as soon as Daniel prayed. But there is a war in the spirit realm, and it took him 21 days to break through the demons that were trying to withhold them from coming to an answer Daniel's prayer. So when we pray, we get it by faith immediately. Sometimes it takes a little while to battle through the spirit realm to get the answer to us, but we don't let go of our faith. We just we know that the answer's coming. And it's probably coming through angels. Now this angel was most likely Gabriel, who had appeared to Daniel earlier in chapter 8, I believe it was. Let's look at that, 8.13. I heard a holy one speaking. And another holy one said to the speaker, How long is this vision to be of perpetual sacrifice, of horrifying iniquity, of sanctuary and army trampled underfoot? The first replied, Until 2,300 evenings and mornings have gone by, then the sanctuary will have its rights restored. So the evenings and mornings, that's a way again, like Genesis 1, the evening and the morning were the first day. These are literal days it's talking about. Not thousand-year days like Peter talks about. 
As I, Daniel, gazed at the vision and tried to understand it, I saw someone standing in front of me who looked like a man. And I heard a human voice cry over the Uliah, Gabriel, tell him the meaning of the vision. He approached the place where I was standing. As he approached, I was seized with terror and fell prostrate on the ground. Son of man, he said to me. So see, it's not just Yeshua called the son of man in Daniel. Daniel's called son of man too. So is Ezekiel. Understand this. The vision shows the time of the end. So that whole thing with the, the chosen where they say because he takes the title son of man, oh, he's claiming to be God. Well, it wasn't just Yeshua that was called son of man. It's a bunch of different prophets. So here we're told that Gabriel looks like a man. And again, Hebrews 13, 2 says, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. And we told that story about the hitchhiker that, that Sam and I picked up, that I felt impressed that we needed to turn around and go get him, and uh, felt impressed that it might be an angel, and told Sam about this verse. We picked him up, took him into downtown Tulsa, let him off, and went to rearrange some stuff, turned back around, and he was gone. So more than likely he was, but Sam needed to understand that this is a possibility. We're being tested. Angels will often look like men. Gabriel seems to be the main messenger angel, and Michael seems to be the main warrior angel. Daniel 9.20, it says, I was still speaking, still at prayer, confessing my own sins and the sins of my people Israel, and placing my plea before Yahweh my God for the holy mountain of my God. Still speaking, still at prayer, when Gabriel, the being I had originally seen in vision, swooped on me in full flight at the hour of the evening sacrifice. He came, he spoke and said to me, Now, Daniel, I have come down to teach you how to understand. When your pleading began, a word was uttered, and I have come to tell you, you are a man specially chosen. Grasp the meaning of the word. Understand the vision. So Gabriel told Daniel that he was sent to teach him how to understand the vision. Yahweh can use angels to bring us revelation. A lot of times he'll use angels when, when there's healing involved even. There is um, Raphael as one of the angels that's actually mentioned in Enoch. Don't know that it's for sure true or not, but Rapha is Yahweh Rapha. He's our healer. Raphael is the God of healing. It's the name for the angel. So he does use angels to do certain things. Angels are also dispatched to protect Yahweh's people. In Psalms 91 9 says, You who say, Yahweh is my refuge and make Elyon your fortress, no disaster can overtake you. No plague shall come near your tent. He has given his angels orders about you to guard you wherever you go. They will carry you in their arms in case you trip over a stone. So his angels are here. You guys have angels. Did you know that? You can't see them necessarily, but they're here. They might be on the bench next to you. Pretty cool, huh? In 2 Kings 6.11, we see this in action. The king of Aram grew very much disturbed over this. He summoned his officers and said, Tell me which one of you is betraying us to the king of Israel. No one, my lord king, one of his officers replied. It's Elisha, the prophet in Israel. The words you utter in your bedchamber, he reveals to the king of Israel. Go and find out where he is, the king said, so that I can send people to capture him. Word was brought to him. He's now in Dothan. So he sent horses and chariots there and a large force. And these, arriving during the night, surrounded the town. Next day, Elisha got up early and went out. And there surrounding the town was an armed force with horses and chariots. Oh, my Lord, his servant said, what are we to do? Do not be afraid, he replied, for there are more on our side than on theirs. And Elisha prayed, Yahweh, he said, open his eyes and make him see. Yahweh opened the servant's eyes, and he saw the mountains covered in fiery horses and chariots surrounding Elisha. As the Armenians came down towards him, Elisha prayed to Yahweh, I beg you to strike these people sunblind. And at Elisha's word, he struck them sunblind. Then Elisha said to them, This is not the road, nor is this the town. These are not the droids you seek. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but this is where the original came from. Follow me. I shall lead you to the man you are looking for. But he led them to Samaria. And they entered Samaria. Elisha said, Yahweh, open these people's eyes and let them see. Yahweh opened their eyes and they saw, and they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, Shall I kill them, father? Do not kill them, he said. Or he replied, Do you kill your own prisoners with sword and bow? Offer them food and water so that they can eat and drink, and then let them go back to their master. 
So obviously the king found out you can't sneak up on somebody that hears your words in your bedchamber. <laughs> I don't care how many people you send. <laughs> it ain't going to work. Now Michael is the main protector of Israel. We know this from Daniel 12, verse 1. It says, at that time Michael will arise. The great prince, defender of your people. That will be a time of great distress, unparalleled since nations first came into existence. When that time comes, your own people will be spared. All those whose names are found written in the book. So what time is this talking about? Revelations 12, 7. And now, war broke out in heaven. When Michael, with his angels, attacked the dragon. And the dragon fought back with his angels. But they were defeated and driven out of heaven. So we know this is a future war because in the book of Job, we know that Satan is up there amongst the sons of, of God in the throne room itself. And God's going where you've been. So we know he has access right now. But when this war happens, he will no longer have access. It's interesting, I was just talking to another brother that thinks this happens actually after the thousand-year reign when Satan's released again. He doesn't believe that this happens actually beforehand. But that would make no sense because nobody fights, the dragon doesn't fight anybody there. They, he gathers them and they try to do something at Jerusalem, but fire rains down from heaven and just wipes them all out. So this obviously isn't the dragon going and doing all this stuff. And, I mean, because when Yeshua is here, we don't have to worry about protection. He is protection. Now, Yeshua goes and deceives those who didn't want to follow the Lamb, because not everybody does. They're being forced to. He's ruling all nations with a rod of iron. But he gets the ones that never really wanted to, that have a rebellious heart. Because we still have flesh nature during the thousand-year reign if you don't have a glorified body. And so they follow Satan. They all surround Jerusalem. The fire runs down and just wipes them all out. So this happens beforehand, obviously. The dragon fought back with his angels, but they were defeated and driven out of heaven. The great dragon, the prim primeval serpent known as the devil or Satan, who had led all the world astray, was hurled down to the earth, and his angels were hurled down with him. Then I heard a voice shout from heaven, Salvation and power and empire forever have been won by our God and all authority for his Messiah. Now that the accuser who accused our brothers day and night before our God has been brought down, they have triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word which they bore witness, because even in the face of death they did not cling to life. So let the heavens rejoice and all who live there. But for you, earth and sea, disaster is coming, because the devil has gone down to you in a rage, knowing that he has little time left. As soon as the dragon found himself hurled down to the earth, he sprang in pursuit of the woman, the mother of the male child, but she was given a pair of great eagle's wings to fly away from the serpent into the desert to the place where she was to, look, uh, to be looked after for a time, two times, and half a time. So the serpent vomited water from his mouth, like a river after the woman to sweep her away in a current. But the earth came to her rescue. It opened its mouth and swallowed the river spewed from the dragon's mouth. Then the dragon was enraged with the woman and went away to make war on the rest of her children who obey God's commandments and have in themselves the witness of Yeshua. Obviously, this is not after Satan's released because the dragon doesn't do anything other than get wiped out at that point and then cast in the lake of fire. So we know that the angels helped the prophets and Yeshua, but you might ask, would they really help me? Luke 7, 28 says, For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. We're now in a new and better covenant. The instructions didn't change. We know that the Torah is the instructions written on our hearts. So we have the same commandments, but now we have the Holy Spirit inside of each and every one of us to empower us to do this. We are literally in a class of creation that is above those Old Testament saints. We've been born again, fused together with Yeshua. We are new creations in a way that they never were. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, at least until they were resurrected when Yeshua was and walked around. Then they would have had the opportunity to be born again. So that was the cool thing about that. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Messiah, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Yeshua Messiah, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Messiah, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, 
We are ambassadors for Messiah as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Messiah's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him to be sin, uh, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, we are new creations. And it's a process. We might become the righteousness of God in him. It's a process that we're working out. We're working out our salvation with fear and trembling. He made him to be the sin sacrifice for us, who knew no sin, the sinless sacrifice, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, how is his righteousness applied? Do we remember Romans chapter 6? Don't you know, realize who you yield yourself servants to obey? That's whose servants you are, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. So our obedience plays a part in our righteousness. It all comes from him, but it comes as we work with him in doing what he wants us to do. And we all have angels assigned to us as a result of this. Matthew 18.10 says, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. Angels have to report to heaven like basically every day. We see that happening in the book of Job. So they come down, they give report, or they give report, they come back down and they continue to do their job. Now how think ye? If a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them gone astray, does he not leave the ninety and nine and, and go after the mountains and seek that which has gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily he says unto you, he rejoices more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So they all have angels. The Father needs us working with his angels giving them a legal reason to act on our behalf. We always have to do our part. We have to operate in faith. We have to obey first, and then it releases the angels to act. We need to speak the word out of our mouth. That will activate them. We don't command them to do anything. We speak the word of Yahweh, and then He tells them what to do. That's how it works. Some people get into the fact that they just get overbalanced in their understanding. They actually start asking angels or commanding angels, thinking they have the right to, but we're never told that anymore in Scripture. It does say they will act on behalf of his word. So when we speak his word, we can activate them. Like I said, Psalms 103.20, Bless Yahweh, you his angels who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. The voice of his word. Not the voice of Yahweh necessarily, but the voice of his word. They heed his word. They do his word. So as long as it's his word, it doesn't matter who's speaking it. Because we know it's his will if it's his word. And his word is forever settled in heaven. So the angels do Yahweh's word, heeding the voice of his word. And like I said, it doesn't matter who speaks it as long as it's done in faith. And we'll look at Mark 11, 22. It says, So Yeshua answered and said to them, Have faith in God. It's not faith in our faith, and it's not even faith in his word. We do know his word works, but it's actually faith in God. For assuredly I say to you that whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says when we're speaking Yahweh's word. That's the key. When we speak in faith in accordance to God's will, he, we are already speaking God's word, and the angels will respond. We can now expect the angels to minister to us just as they did to Yeshua. Matthew 4.10 Then Yeshua said to him, Away with you, Satan! For it is written, You shall worship Yahweh your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So we're the one with our Creator, Yeshua, and our Father, Echad. Just like it says in the Shema, they are Echad, they're one. John says, or Yeshua says in John 10, I and the Father are Echad. We can say the same thing now, and this is because of John 14, verse 11. It says, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Again, you can see the conditions here. It's always conditional. If you love me, keep my commandments. 
And then I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So he not only gives the Holy Spirit, he is the Holy Spirit. Because he's talking about sin and the Holy Spirit. Then he says, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to come to you. So they're echad. They're one and the same. A little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father. And you in me and I in you. We are tied in together. We are echad. Just like they're echad, we're echad with them now. Not because of anything that we've done that's special or we didn't deserve any of it. He just loved us enough, and we received it by faith. And then we act on it. We are part of Him. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. Now, we are to represent Yeshua in the earth today. That's our job. We took over His job. 1 Corinthians 2.1 says, And I, I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Yeshua Messiah and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. He wasn't just a great speaker, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He wants us to learn to walk by faith so that we can let His power flow through us because it's done by faith. It's all Him. But it doesn't happen through everybody. We know that. Most Christians don't have any power because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. It talks about in Hebrews that it says, let us lay aside the sin and the weights that do so easily beset us. Not everything is sin. But if we want to walk the way that Yeshua walked, we're going to have to do what He did. He was focused on the mission. He could have had anything he wanted. He could have had the best chariot with the best horses and, and lived in the biggest house, had the fanciest and the servants and everything else. He could have had anything he wanted. But it would have hindered him. It would have shackled him from doing the mission. Even though he could have had it, he chose not to. He chose to stay focused on the mission. We can... I mean, we have to go out and work. We're in the world, but not of it. But... Even at work, we can still kind of listen to Scripture. We can talk about Him. We can share Him with others. That great big carpenter guy had an opportunity to share Yeshua with him the other day. The guys were talking about him. And uh, we were in there just talking and, and just discussing Scripture. So, I mean, we can discuss Scripture on the job. Um, come home from work. Most of the time I'm brain dead. I just don't feel like talking. So I like watching something on TV, but I've made the choice that if I'm going to watch something, it's going to be something that's going to speak about Yahweh and make me learn more about Him or or just, it's going to build faith is what it is, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. Not everything that we watch necessarily is evil. If it's secular, it, it, it could be, but there's certain things like Little House on the Prairie, stuff like that. It's not really evil, and Every once in a while, it's really not bad, but you got to be careful because Satan is going to try to steal our time. He's going to try to get us off track. He's going to try to get us distracted, and it might not even be wicked. It, it, it might just be something stealing our time because he does not want us doing the mission. We've got to be focused. We've got to guard our time, and even if it's something's not evil, we've got to really be careful how much time we put in it because if we catch ourselves thinking about stuff that's not Yahweh, that's a good indication of where, what our God really is. It's where our thoughts go to by default. When we know it automatically goes back to Yahweh, that's our focus. We know that. So we've got to watch our thoughts. We've got to bring every thought to the obedience of the Messiah. But we need to understand that everything we do is either going to build faith or it's going to make faith shrink. Faith is not static. It does not remain the same. It has to be. That's why daily we have to speak the Word. We have to meditate in the Torah day and night. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. Your faith's either going to be growing or it's going to be shrinking. We're the only ones that could determine what that process is going to be. So we've got to make sure that we're constantly thinking about Him. We're constantly speaking His Word. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. He said that for a reason. He understands the principles. But we have free will. He gives us the choice. We can either use our weapons or we can walk after the flesh. So we have to choose. We have to be 
understanding that Satan is going to seek to try to steal our time. He's going to try to get us off the mission when we've got to guard against that. Going on with verse 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory, or for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. So we have to get it through His Spirit. But His words are spirit and they are life. So it, the Word and the Spirit kind of go together. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of Yahweh, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Messiah. But again, even though his love is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, we still have to put on love. Even though we have the mind of Messiah, we still have to meditate in the Torah and constantly bring that thinking to our minds. Because our minds leak. Our brains leak. So we have to constantly get back into it daily and daily speak his word and daily. Satan is relentless. He's going to come daily to try to get us off track. So we have to daily, we have to build some discipline and daily confess the word. Daily speak words of life. Daily get into the word. Daily meditate on him and his goodness. Thinking on the things that are good, lovely, pure, and perfect on purpose. And it's not automatic. It does not automatically happen. We have to purposely do it. Now we have the mind of Messiah, and we can do everything that he did and greater because we now have his Holy Spirit and the angels ministering for us as well. See, there's more for us than to be against us. Even though there's more wicked people in the world, we have way more angels. And guess what? Angels are way more powerful than wicked people. They only have so many angels that they can have to do their bidding. Yeah, they're relentless and they attack, but we've got way more on our side than they have on theirs, even though there's more of them. One can put a thousand flight on our side. Two can put ten thousand flight. We have a synergy, and we can sick the angels on them in a way that is even more relentless than what they think they're doing. John 1:47 says, "Yeshua said to Nathaniel, or saw Nathaniel coming towards him, and remarked, here is a true Israelite who is sincere.'" Nathaniel answered Yeshua, or asked Yeshua, "How do you know anything about me?" Yeshua answered him, "I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you." Nathaniel said to Yeshua, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Yeshua replied, you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Yeshua said to Nathaniel, I can guarantee this truth. You will see the sky open and God's angels coming, going up and coming down to the Son of Man. He is that Jacob's ladder. Now, where are Yeshua's ambassadors? And we can expect the same thing, because we are his body now. And the angels, even as they ministered to him after his temptation, they can minister to us as well. It's not that we necessarily seek that, but we just need to know this is how Yahweh uses them. Yeshua is in us now, and he's never going to leave us. So we can expect the same type of things that he did. He says, the works that I do will you do in greater works, because I'm going to the Father. He sent the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that gave him the ability to do what he did. Now it's up to us to study his word, to get our faith to grow. He's the author and the finisher, the perfecter of our faith, but we have to do our part by faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So we have to do that part. We have to purposely put on the word and listen to it. That's the neat thing about the one thing that I've seen that all the great men of faith have in common, whether it be Smith Wigglesworth, anybody that's ever raised the dead, they got that power because of studying the Word. 
I mean, Lester Summerall went over there to learn from Smith Wigglesworth. He was the only one because Smith was a rough old codger that nobody wanted to be around. <laughs> Lester Summerall didn't care, though. He just he went over there with the newspaper the first time, and Smith said, What's that under your arm? And the newspaper says, Leave that trash outside. There's nothing that comes in here with the word of God. I mean, he was just rude and crude, but he was straightforward, and he could raise the dead. So Lester, Lester left it outside and went in, and, and they sat there, and they read the Scripture for half an hour. And then they prayed for half an hour, and they went back and read the scripture for half an hour. That's how Smith Wigglesworth spent his free time. He had figured out the source of power. And that's what he did. He lived, he, he ate, drank, breathed, breathed the word of God, and then prayer. He just had a relationship with Yahweh. It's not a formula. It's a relationship with Yahweh. And that's really the bottom line. And that there's no shortcuts, really. If we want to walk in the power of Yahweh, which he wants us to do, we're supposed to demonstrate his word with power, not just clever words, talking people into the kingdom. He wants us to demonstrate it, and if we're going to do that, we have to do it individually. Each one of us have to take the time to get into the Word and do what it takes to build our faith up. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word, and we all have to choose to do it. It can't just be the leader. I'm not. I'm only one guy. It takes the team. We all have to know how to do this. I mean, if you're out, you have a car wreck, and Maybe you get killed. Holly needs to know how to raise you from the dead. If I'm not there and she can't get a hold of me, she needs to be able to do that. Oh, we all need to do that. Because we're at war. And we're not always going to have each other to rely on. It's more powerful if we have the team. But we all have to have this individually. And it takes individual commitment to get it. So we've all got to get into the Word and do what it takes to get strong. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the revelation of the job that your angels do for us. We thank you, Father, for Yeshua that came as the messenger of Yahweh to carry out your will, to represent you. Father, we thank you that now we have become your ambassadors, that we have become new creations, born again, fused together with Elohim himself, and that you need us to go out and represent you to the world. Father, help us to have the drive. It's you that's in us, both the will and the do of your good pleasure. We know this. We have to make that decision, though, and we have to be committed as well. Help us to have the drive to continue to follow you, to build our faith so that we can raise the dead when we need to. We can cast out devils instantly when we need to. We're here to do what Yeshua did. Yeshua lived that fasted lifestyle. He was focused on the mission. Help us to be focused on the mission at hand. We know, Father, that we are in the world, but not of it. We have kids to raise, we have jobs that we have to go through, we have other responsibilities as well, but help us to always default back to you, to bring our thoughts back to you, to thank you in everything that we do, everything we do in word or in deed, we do it for you, the motivation is to please our King, we are here for your glory, Father, I thank you that you've made us a kingdom of priests, thank you for the blessing on your people, Israel, Yivarechecha Yahweh, Va'yishmarecha Ya'er Yahweh P'navelecha V'hunecha Yesa Shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen.